Okay, I'm going to start us out. Um, you, you all know we're Doug and Linda Town. We work with Wycliffe Bible Translators in Mexico, and we've been working there for, uh, I figured it out, about 33 years. So um, our children, we have three boys, they were raised in Mexico. Um, they speak fluent Spanish better than us sometimes. I, I've sometimes said to my kids, what's the word for this or that? And they'll, they got it, they know it. <laughs> so just a quick rundown of our kids. Um, Paul is the oldest, he's married to Hope. And they are in Mexico, um, living in a house that we bought down there years ago. Um, so they're buying it from us. Um, they, um, sure. They're with Wycliffe Bible Translators also. They're working, um, but they're not working in translation. They're working, um, he's working as a computer consultant. So all of us have computers, and uh, he helps uh, all of us with our computers. Um, and then his wife, Hope, works in finance. And then our second son, Timo, his name is Timothy, but he goes by Timo. Um, Timo is in Tucson, uh, near where we are. And he... Um, He's, he's been in Mexico working as a, a missionary, as a soccer coach and chaplain um, for teams of young boys. And then he, there's an adult team as well that he plays on because he loves soccer. Um, so anyway, that's uh, his life that I think he's going back to. Um, and then our youngest son, Joey, is also in Tucson. He's uh, about 45 minutes away from where we live. He lives with a, a, um, caregivers. He's a young man with autism. And um, he, it's really nice for him to be right downtown Tucson because he's involved in, uh, well, he works. He works um, as a landscaper. But then he's involved in Special Olympics. And he's always doing something with Special Olympics. So that's kind of um, what our family is doing. Um, I wanted to tell you just a little bit, in case you are not real familiar with Wycliffe Bible Translators. Um, I don't know if you know that there's uh, 700, I mean, sorry, 7,300 languages in the world, approximately. Um, <laughs> so um, Wycliffe's goal, purpose, is to um, make Scripture available. Um, we usually starting with the New Testament, available in those languages. So far, there's, there are still about 2,000 that don't have any scripture at all in their language. So um, one of the processes that we go through, we chose to serve in Mexico, and they take us to different um, places, different village areas where there is no scripture, and and then we decide, well, we want to work in this area, um, you know, with a lot of consultation and prayer. But um, anyway, so we started out in Sacatepec. That's the name of the town where we worked and lived. And um, we learned the language. And then uh, they, they didn't have a written language when we started. So we, we um, have had linguistic training and learned how to figure out what the orthography, they call it, is, what the writing system should be like. Of course, we use letters just like we do in English or a lot of other languages, um, but we needed to decide which which sounds were significant in this language compared to, you know, make up make up their alphabet. I'm, I'm going too far into all that. But anyway, that's what we worked on the first um, years of our time there. And then when we passed a test showing that we could speak enough Mestec, you know, be understood and understand them, then we began translation. So that was lots of years ago. In 2016, um, the New Testament was finished. It was recorded. Doug has it here. Um, and we presented it to the people, the Mistec people of the town of Sacatepec. Um, this book that, um, go ahead, Doug. Uh, this book shows pictures of that presentation. And the, the fun thing was, um, you know, in Mexico, when something significant happens, you have a fiesta. You have the party, you know. And so they did have a party. Um, and I just want to tell you one story from that party that was just so special to us. We, as, as Americans, even though we 
have been integrated into their culture. They love us. They, you know, we eat their food and they love that. We speak their language. Um, but we didn't know exactly how to plan this party, exactly how to, we knew we had to have food and we had to have music and, you know, those kinds of things. But um, we asked some of the guys that have been working with us, guys and gals that have been working with us on translation, we asked them, well, uh, one guy in particular, we said, would you be the MC of this um, party? And he said, yes, I will. And so then we said, well, <clears throat> what would you, how would you like to organize it? And um, so he said, uh, Nicolas said, well, I think we should have an open mic. So in other words, give anybody the microphone, anybody who wants to say something about the translation. And we kind of went, oh, I never would have thought of that. Um, but it was a God thing because this one gal, um, Manuela, Doug will show you the picture of Manuela. She, had, she was the first gal that started out with us teaching us her language. Um, and... Anyway, and then we hadn't worked with her for years because she got into other things. She was actually a senator. Is that what they call it? Or like a state senator, a state senator um, for the state of Oaxaca. So she was busy with other things. So we hadn't worked with her for a long time. Obviously, she has influence in the town because she's a woman and she's a senator. And she, you know, was a Mistec speaker who made good, you know, who became important. So anyway, all this to say... Manuela came to the microphone when he offered the free mic. And Manuela and her family, <clears throat> along with lots and lots of people, are pretty um, strong Catholics. Lots of people in Mexico are pretty strong Catholics. Um, but what she said just brought tears to my eyes because she stood up and she said, this book is a treasure. I want you to treasure this book. This is our language. This is, this is, these are our words, but they're God's words to us. And you, you don't mistreat this book. And she went on and on to endorse the New Testament in their language. And I was just floored because then she also said, it doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or whether you're evangelical, which there aren't very many evangelicals in the area, but um, doesn't matter. This book is God's word. And it was just as if, I mean, it was just as if God was using her mouth and speaking to people. And we didn't even stand up and say, well, this book is true and this book is important. And this, you know, we didn't do that. Um, but God used Manuela to do that. So we were just so excited and thankful that, first of all, Nicolas decided that we would have that open mic and then that Manuela would come up with her power and influence, you know, endorse this. So we thank God for that. Um, we were all able to be there as a family. A few other people um, were there with us and it was just a really cool celebration. Um, if you look in that book, there's a picture of a, um, of a cow. Um, a friend of ours helped us to get the cow and they made some really nice food out of that. And um, I have a scar from that <laughs> You want to tell? <laughs> no. no. Anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Well, um, um, I, I'm not a farmer, and actually the guys that w we bought the cow together weren't very good farmers either, I don't think, and so we saw the cow in a herd of cows, and it was a cow, so it was just a woman thing, you know, and so we, we wanted to bring the cow, you know, away from the herd, uh, you call it herds, <laughs> the, the group of cows <laughs> and bulls, and, uh, and she didn't want to leave. And so we got ropes, and we're trying to pull, and it didn't, you know, just kind of suck. And we twisted the tail, and we saw that on the movies, you know, and it just didn't work. And then, uh, and we're trying to get her to come through this narrow kind of corral, this narrow road area with barbed wire on either side, you know, to come down to the truck and hop in the truck so we could, you know. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know what to do, and I had this this red shirt on, and, and so I just said something in Mistec, Na'aki, you know, says, come quickly, and then I did a flash my red shirt, and then all of a sudden, he kind of did this with his foot and just started charging me, you know, and the cow had horns, and I said, okay, this is, <laughs> no, I guess some cows have horns some places, and, and, um, and I said, okay, I better move, <laughs> you know, so I jumped into the fence, and that's where I got the scar, and then the cow went past me and broke a horn. And finally, we got it tied to the truck and pulled it from into the place where where they barbecued her. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. So, so I uh, still didn't learn. I don't think I'll do that again. <laughs> yes, we learned a lot of um, things in Zacatepec from the people there. Um, one of the things we learned was uh, we were having a church meeting at one point where they were going to um, serve chicken. And so the ladies from the church were going to take the the slaughtered chickens to the river um, and wash them. And so I went with them and I was, they, we were standing in the river and other women were starting right in washing the chickens and I kind of, and I think we were quartering, or I mean, we were cutting them up and washing all the pieces and everything. And so one lady said to me, do you know how to do this? And I said, no. <laughs> so she came right alongside me and showed me how to, you know, open it up and all this. Um, and it's a, just a different experience to do it in a river, you know, but that's, if they have lots of things, lots of washing. <laughs> we, I did um, laundry in the river many times too, um, but that was mostly when um, we didn't have water at the house. It's a different kind of system there where they, different neighborhoods in town get water on certain days. So we get water on Tuesdays, for example, and if we get enough water, then it fills up the tank, then we're fine. But some days, some weeks, they don't send us any water. So then if that happens two weeks in a row, then you're stuck. You have to go to the river to do your wash and do whatever, you know, bathing or whatever there. So it's, it's a funny use of the river. It takes us a long time to get used to it because, you know, people are washing chickens, they're washing their truck, they're washing their laundry all in the same area. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just want to bring you up to speed. After the presentation of the New Testament in Zacatepec, um, Doug and I, well, I was worn out. I was actually burned out. And so I needed to come back to the U.S. And Doug decided that if we were going to come back to the U.S., then he would study uh, in seminary um, and specialize in Hebrew, uh, well, biblical languages, but particularly Hebrew. So that's what we did. We were in Portland, Oregon at a, at Multnomah University there. And um, I, in just a second, I'll let you know how he, or he'll let you know, how he used that Hebrew training um, in his next job. But first, I'll just say what my job is now with Wycliffe Bible Translators. I um, I have a dual row, two, two part-time jobs. I'm a an editor, because um, in many countries in which Wycliffe works, um, we're not allowed to go in as missionaries. Um, some of the Southeast Asian countries, you can imagine. Um, we go in as linguists, because we're all trained in linguistics, so we, um, we have to write papers um, about linguistic things, the, the, the things we're discovering in the languages in which we work. Um, so they're describing the grammar, describing a certain characteristic of how this language works, and I edit those papers. Um, so it's kind of fun. I'm reading about languages in Africa. I'm reading about languages in different parts of the world, and I'm just correcting, you know, copy editing, correcting grammar things or, you know, that kind of thing. And sometimes it's challenging because some of the writers of these papers are... Um, not English speakers, not native English speakers. Um, so that's kind of fun to figure out what, they're, what they mean. <laughs> um, my other role is I'm a member care person. So um, we live in, in north of Tucson in Catalina, and um, it's a place where a lot of our retired members are living. Um, so they need things like take them to the doctor's appointment they have or, you know, help them to figure out how to sort through their stuff as they're downsizing and things like that. So I come alongside people with that. And it's kind of a perfect combination of working with people um, and also working on the computer. I can do it from anywhere, the editing job I do. But I'd like to hand the mic over to Doug and let him talk about his work. Well, when we first I went up to, to Portland... Um, I was kind of scared, you know, here I'm 60 years old and I'm, I'm going back to school. And I thought, I don't know if I can do that, you know. So I went there and I got accepted in the master's program there. And, um, and I was the oldest one in the class, you know. So here's all these 25-year-olds or 23-year-olds. 
and I and I came in I came into the class with a um, with a notebook, you know, and a pen, and they all had their computer things and notebooks. What do you call them? Those, I guess, uh, yeah, notebook things. And and they, and they asked me, what is what is that? what what are you doing? Why do you got this thing? I said, well, I don't know. That's how I take notes, you know. And I said, okay. And anyway, and it and it did. I did pretty well actually, and they were surprised. I think, and. Uh, it was kind of fun because I had a lot of experience, and, and even with Hebrew, our Mistec language um, has a, it's a non-European language, and uh, Hebrew is a non-European language, and they have a lot in common. And, for example, the verb aspects work very, very similarly, and the word order you know, it's just the same. And so, and so I, w I had some insight that even the teacher didn't have into Hebrew. I said, well, I know what that means, you know. And she said, what, what? And then I would say, because I, I just, it's, I, you know, I've analyzed it in our, own, in our own language, in the Mistec language. And then she had me teach a couple of classes, or second, she had me teach her second year class when I was in first year, just a couple of classes on, on translation principles and, and linguistics a little bit. And, and it was really fun because it helped me to sort of understand Mistec better and uh, understand Hebrew better and help me as a consultant, which is my present job, that's the one you want me to talk about, <laughs> that I, I work as an Old Testament consultant. And a lot of it is, is virtual. I use um, programs that we have on the computer that use the cloud to, to pass information back and forth to the teams and their mother translation teams, you know, there's no expatriate there in the village area. There's four or five of them in each group that are working, and a lot of them have translated um, the, the New Testament, but they're working on Old Testament things, and some of them are, pl are working toward finishing the whole Bible in their language, and um, so I work as a consultant, and I, they give me, I don't read their language, I mean, I can't understand their language, so they translate it into, back into Spanish, um, from their language so that I can sort of understand what they're saying in their language and I, I, t I take notes and I send notes and ask questions and we interface, we interchange um, using um, Zoom and Skype and phone calls sometimes when there's no internet there. And, uh, and then usually, well it's been twice a year, um, except for last year I didn't go because of the COVID, but twice a year that I go and have a face-to-face -face time with him. And the face-to-face -face time is really, really fun because you, you learn things and you see things that you can't see on Zoom. I don't know how many of you guys are tired of Zoom. I'm one. No. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you just sit there and you just sort of can sort of feel what they're thinking or see what they're thinking on their faces and, and how they're interacting with one another. And we also have what we call scripture engagement, um, times where we get to take the scripture out into the community and go into their churches. And we walked up this hill in this one town called um, San Marcos. It's in the state of Puebla. And we went up to this hill, this little town, um, way up. And I thought, oh, I can do that. And I was afraid that one of the older men wasn't going to make it because he was a little overweight, more than I was even. And I said, oh, I don't know if he's going to make it. But I was the one that almost didn't make it. You know, he has goats and stuff, so he's used to it. <laughs> so we walked up, I think it was like twelve or 13,000 feet, and then back down to a town. And, and then we, we brought the, the translated um, book of, of Ruth to a, a little Bible study, about 10 people. And the pastor was a he didn't speak the language. It was uh, Ngiwa is the name of the language. And so we read Ruth. They, you know, the, our, our gang read Ruth in their own language, or one chapter of Ruth. And all the people were just listening and interacting. And the pastor was surprised. I says, I didn't think that they ever listened to what people said, you know. And it's because he was trying to speak to them in Spanish. And, and they were just disengaging with the scripture. And it's just fun to see people respond to it. And and it just spoke their language, basically, literally, you know. And, uh, and they also, because of COVID, a lot of them weren't able to have church services, but they, they, um, sometimes they have broadcasting on loudspeakers, you know, where they would read scripture or have sermons on the loudspeaker in the language. And they, they um, were able to set up some FM radio stations, sort of like they, sort of like the Zoom things here, but it wasn't quite so sophisticated. And where people would listen to it in their homes, the ones that don't have computers, just have a little radio, and just, they're still doing that. And they're meeting in person now as well. And it was just, it was just fun. I just got back from a six-week stint um, in four different groups, and we spent a week 
in each one. And I live with the, the families. I go there and it says, okay, I'm your son or I'm your brother or something like that. And the families feed me and, and we meet with the teams. And, and one other thing that, that was one of my goals, because I'm old. No, I'm probably the youngest one here. No, I'm 64. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, no, that's not true. <laughs> I shouldn't, say, I shouldn't have said that. Forgive me for saying that. And uh, I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to do this for another 40 years, I don't think, because I'll be old, really old then. Uh, so i got to train other people. You know, like Second Timothy 2.2 2 says, what's it say? If I was younger, I would remember. And the things you learn from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to other men who will be able to teach others also. And... Um, just that says, well, I got to teach others how to do that, what I'm doing. And so I have one, two, three, three um, people that I'm mentoring, and they're all Latin Americans. One lives in Paraguay, and one lives in Bolivia. He's from, she's from, a woman from Bolivia. And the third one is in Mexico. His name is Leo and Danielle and Mary. And so all three of those I'm training, and I'm, I'm, we're doing some um, exegetical things together, and we evaluate each other's work, and we meet with the teams. And Danielle, this last time, went with me for two weeks in Mexico, and we went to two of the different areas and just to get some village experience. He's a native from Paraguay, and he kind of had a culture shock. You think, oh, he's Latin, but, but they don't eat the hot stuff in Paraguay, uh, spicy stuff. And so when, you know, and the people in the villages were giving us their best meals. And so they give us this mole, which is chili with a little bit of chocolate and more chili <laughs> and chicken. And, uh, and, you know, we ate at different people's houses every night. And each, each family wanted to give us their best meal. And each one of them was mole with chicken. And, and my roommate says, okay, I'm my roommate, I'm Danielle. I'm saying, okay, I'm supposed to eat what they give to me. But this is the third time in a row. I don't know if I can handle it. So anyway, he survived and he went back um, to Paraguay. But we're continuing to work together. We're going to do um, um, Second Samuel, another book together with one of the teams. And I think he'll come back to Mexico if it works out, maybe next year sometime with me again. And so... And Mary is, um, she's a, a, a single um, lady from Peru. She's going to work with a Paraguay team. And it's a Ache, it's a language group. And it's a group of indigenous translators that are working. And she's going to try to learn how to adapt to the culture. And she's never lived in an indigenous area. And most of my, what I've been doing has been online. And, but they want me to go there toward the end of her stay just to debrief and and if, you know, to figure out if we can help her in any way there. I'll be working with other people there as well. And anyway, I'll shut up. <laughs> so it's, it's a blessing and it's a need. Why, why, do we do, why did I want to do Old Testament? Because I realized that there's a lot of New Testament consultants, and I was one too. But there's not too many people that are experienced or have the background in Hebrew to, and my background's real minimal, but I'm learning more, to be able to be an Old Testament consultant. And a lot of these groups want the whole Bible. I think we all want the whole Bible in our language, and so I can be used of God to help that to come about. I just wanted to say, Doug is kind of, um, kind of in, in the beautiful golden years of his life where everything that God has built into his life up until now is is being used and is being um, just uh, coming to fruition where um, he loves his job. It's just fun to watch. He loves being with people. He loves um, pouring over God's word in the original and thinking through, you know, how do you express this in a way that... Um, that really communicates in the language that we're, we're working in. And I've just enjoyed watching him. Uh, every now and then we might say something about, you know, how many years are we going to keep going? And he's, he's saying, I'm going to go till I'm 70 if I can, you know. And um, just it's just really fun to see how God has brought all the past things into fruition. And like he was saying, in t teaching other um, young men and women um about his role and i just um uh, what, what time are we supposed to quit <laughs> oh
Okay, so so we'll do questions. But um, I just wanted to say too that um, I was reading somewhere uh, on one of Wycliffe's websites and it said, nobody should have to learn another language in order to have access to God's word. And, you know, that's really true. Why, uh, who... Who we are is so wrapped up in the language we speak. And I know you've heard illustrations about, you know, people who live in the extreme north have all these different words for snow and, you know, things like that. And people who live in Mexico have all these different words for corn and the different stages of corn and the different parts of a corn stalk and all of that. Um, and it's, it's so true that our language, we're just wrapped up in in our language, we see the world through our language. So it's it's just a privilege we for, voice. we hear God's voice through, yeah. It's just a privilege to work with people who, we, we're starting to see um, the world through their language, and they have some expressions in their language that are just, that just open up scripture to me too. And I think, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's just, it's been a lot of, it's been quite a ride. <laughs> we've um, gone through quite a lot of things as a family but God has been very faithful to us and I just wanted to say too that this church has been very faithful to us Doug um, started out in this church when he was at Humboldt State University and I was not in his life at that time but um, he was very nurtured in this church and with people in this church so we thank you for your continued um, involvement with us and in prayer and in your financial giving and the prayer group that um, that meets and prays for missionaries. We really appreciate all that. I was baptized in the Mad River at pumping station number four, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know why they didn't choose the Trinity River. That seemed more holy or something, but I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so we just want to give you guys the chance to ask questions and about anything you want to ask about. Um, I, I have studied Greek, but I don't know it as well, and I, I focus more at the Multnomah as an Old Testament focus. I took one year of Greek, and I had one year at Moody that I did correspondence, and so I can read Greek, and I, and, but I've been working exclusively lately on the Old Testament things. People have asked me to do New Testament things, and I say no because I can't do everything. Ben Aramaic, I haven't studied at all. It's, it's similar to Hebrew. I mean, there's a lot of cognates. It's a, it's, it's a related language, and, but I just have to read things about it. Um, that's a good question. Um, we don't have um, overt opposition to to be to us being there to us translating. Um, what we do have is sort of a lack of interest and also a cultural aspect that makes it really hard. The Mestec people don't don't like to rise up above their fellow Mestecs. There there should be nobody who sticks their head up and becomes a leader of their own making. Um, so, for example, um, for a, a man, young man, a man to become a pastor of a Mestec church, they just won't do that. Uh, you, you don't do that in their culture. They're all on an equal plane. And um, if he were to stick up his head and say, I'll be the leader of this church, everyone would put him down. Everyone would criticize and put him down and you know, squash it so that's been something that's been really hard um, to overcome at this point a lot of the Spanish speakers are leaders of the churches and um, it just doesn't work really well I'll just tell you real quickly we were in a church service there Spanish man um, speaking about the King James their their version of the King James version of the Bible in in Spanish and he his whole sermon was on baptism. And there's um, a couple sitting behind us who are Mies Tech speakers, older people. And we were about to wrap up the sermon. And he's saying, now, is there anyone here who wants to get baptized? And this sweet little old woman behind me kind of taps me on the shoulder. And she says to me in Mies Tech, what is baptism? I like the whole sermon. 
She didn't know what baptism was. She didn't have any idea what that was talking about. And so I kind of turned to her and used the word that we've been using, you know, in the new, in the, when we in translated the New Testament, you know, the word for baptism. And I gave her that word or that phrase. And then I explained a little bit. And then the pastor is all nervous. What are you saying? You know, what, what are you guys talking about over there? You know, and I said, well, I was just explaining to her in Misek. So then he tries to explain and explain in Spanish. But you keep using the word baptism because that's the word in, well, bautizo in Spanish. So anyway, it just was an eye-opening thing to me that they can sit through a whole sermon and not really know what we're talking about. So anyway. Um, I... I um in our own village, they have a, a Catholic church that's, that most of the people would consider themselves Catholic. And a lot of the people that have accepted this scripture are from that church, including the priests. Um, the priests don't speak. Well, there's one priest that tried to learn to speak it. And a couple of them were jealous of us because we could speak it and they couldn't. And, and, but most of them have been really receptive and they've, they've, uh, they've showed the Jesus. We have a Luke video. Um, the Jesus film in in Mistec, and they show it in their in in their context, and and they they have read scripture in the masses, like the New Testament, and had people read it, you know, that knew how to read, and so they've been pretty open to it. I don't know, but I know that there's some in other places that that's not true, and the Catholic isn't a um, what, hom- homogeneous word, <laughs> homogeneous. I don't know what the word. You know, it, it, it looks different in different areas, and I'm sure it looks different here than it looks there, even. And, and there's some of the priests, I think, that are real true believers. There's one example of one of our co-workers. Um, uh, he's, the priest is uh, from Africa. He's a black man. And he goes out like a, a circuit rider kind of thing into the Mistec area where John, my, my co-worker wasn't able to go to. It's too dangerous, and, and he doesn't know how to get there to some of those places, but he took the Bibles and, and these mega voices, like the little recorded MP3 thing, and has taken them out to all the different people, and, and, and he's, he's been learning Mistech himself as a priest. He's a young guy, and he just is on fire for the Lord, I think, you know, and, and you know, Catholic has some doctrines that we don't agree with, but I don't, some of these priests don't emphasize those at all. It's hard, and part of it is the motivation because they've been told all their lives that Mistec doesn't have value by the, the non-Mistec um, community. And they says, well, you know, it's not a real language, it's an animal language, and they get all kinds of stupid prejudice against it. And so their parents were, some of them were beaten in school because they were using the language on the playground. And so they said, I don't want my kids to go through this. And so they, they try to de-emphasize it. But one interesting thing at the dedication, I don't know if there's a picture of it, of that uh, I said, okay, I'm going to, you know, these things cost, what is it, 100 pesos a piece, I think. It was like $5. And um, it says, but I'm going to give it free to anybody, that, you know, that's a native speaker who can read three or four verses to me. And so they came up, and there was a whole line of kids out there, and some of them never read Mistek in their life, but they could do it. It's written in a way that they can just emphasize. They know the language especially. They can sound it out. And, um, and, and I gave quite a few free ones, and they thought they were getting something, and I, I, I know that they were getting something. You know? so, so, and we, we taught, we've, we've taught literacy classes, and they teach literacy classes, but it's, I would say that this language is probably on the da- endangered list of, of dying because of, of the history. And there's other places, like some of the er- other areas that I've been working with, the Old Testament, that in languages that I don't speak, they're more, the language is really, really alive and everybody speaks it and they don't speak Spanish at all, which is, which is just the way it is in different places. Yeah, it does. And we, uh-huh, we have an app. We have time. Well, anyway, I can do it later. We have an app on our phone that will stop. That has um, a written language and the oral language, and it had, highlights each line. And so people that don't know how to read it can listen to it and, and watch it. And just it's a it's a ABC way literacy way to 
to learn and recognize it. And it's not hard. A lot of them are afraid of it because they don't think they can do it. But once they try, they realize it's not hard. Yeah. And pretty soon, they knew all the words, but if we left off a word, yeah. you know, <laughs> 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 yes. trying to go to bed early, you know? <laughs> It's interesting because some of them were reading upside down because they were looking from across from the table or something like that. <laughs> No, anyway. <laughs> um, one, one part of our job is to do literacy as well as, you know, translation. So um, we want the people to be able to read when they receive the New Testament. So we have, I have several in here, little books that um, are, are stories that they have in their language. So we've written those out, printed them with some drawings and um, other really simple things like an alphabet book that shows you know what we use with our kids and those kinds of things so we've been teaching literacy all along especially the kids were interested in that um some and, uh, yeah go ahead and they're teaching they're teaching it too in the schools um yeah. it's part of their their mandate from the government to teach some um, teach to read and write and and some of them take it seriously and and they do it the best they can uh-huh yes Yes, they have what's called bilingual kindergartens, and in the bilingual kindergartens, the teachers um, theoretically should speak Misek to them and be introducing them to Spanish at the same time. So they'll give an instruction in Misek and then repeat it in Spanish. Um, so we know this because our children went to the bilingual kindergarten. Um, we wanted them exposed to that. And people in town would say to us, why did you send your kids to the bilingual kindergarten? Because those are kind of lower class um, education in their thinking. Why didn't you send them to this upper class kindergarten? I mean, it wasn't really upper class, but you know. Um, and we said, well, because our kids are bilingual. And they'd look at us and say, oh, <laughs> but we really just wanted to interact with people, parents, and everybody at that. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Just do the verse, and I'll find it. Okay. Um, which verse do you want me to read? Okay. I should let you hear it from the app. It'd be, but I'll read it too. My voice is good. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. No. Matahitna ora tuvi man nunyevi takani chayo maraku matu'un. Should I translate it or not? Tamaraku matu'un ika yora chi in dio da huni kura dio ndia. It says, in the beginning, or a long time ago, when the earth was um, made to appear, created, um, um, I see not was Takani. It means um, I don't know how to say it in English. Um, it was it was already was. that was the the word of God. The the man or we put man here. Man who was the who is the word, but is and was and will be are different in Mystic. Uh, and the man who is the word. This man who is the word. He is with God. And also, he is God. Uh, okay. That's, um, <laughs> well, how hard is it for us? <laughs> no, no. I think they, well, the ones that are that Catholic um, believe in the Trinity, and there are a group of, of non-Catholics who are kind of Jesus only ones and they don't understand it at all. They think that Jesus is the Trinity and and they're using the scripture there too and I'm just hoping I mean we don't have the word Trinity in the scripture but we have it the way it is and mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh -huh. Right, that's what we attempt to do when we're um, developing the written language is to make it phonetic. So, for example, in English, um, we have many ways to pronounce our vowels. An A can be A or A or, you know, all these things. In, 
in Mistec and the other languages that we translate into, we make sure that each vowel has one sound, you know, and each um, consonant has one sound. And the, the things that are difficult in this um, language are tone. Um, it's a tonal language, just like Chinese or, you know, Mandarin, some of the others. Um, so the tone is uh, something they have to learn to read. And then the other thing they have to learn to read is what we call a glottal stop. It's where you stop your voice for a second. Um, like Doug was reading, tu -un, tu -un. It's um, uh, yeah, it's a nasalized word also, but ba'a. Um, I'll just say really quickly, the word ba'a means good, and the word ba'a means bad. So um, it's a tone, that's the tonal difference. And um, the ba'a we do this in English a little bit. We, go, we do uh-uh, no uh or, you know, like we're saying uh-huh. Uh, well, no, uh-huh doesn't have a glottal stop. But anyway, uh -huh. it's, hard for, it's hard for them to learn to read the glottal stop because Spanish doesn't have that. Um, Spanish doesn't have any um, nasalization, like we write it with an N on the end of the word so they know that all the vowels in that word are nasalized, like tu -un. Um but anyway, there's, when we teach literacy, we have, first we have lessons on what is the same in Spanish as in Mistec, and then a few lessons, on, or well, the rest of the lessons are all on things that are different. Um, so they have to learn to read the glottal stop, and they have to learn to read tone, and they have to learn to read an X, which is an SH sound, and, you know, things that Spanish generally doesn't have. Yes, yes. Um, before we were married, I, I was, um, first I was an English teacher in high school, but then I became an English as a second language teacher, and I went to China for a year and taught there, um, and then um, that came in really handy in Mexico because each of the junior high schools, even in these small little village areas, are supposed to have an English teacher, and those would be people that were educated in a bigger city, and then they send them out to the villages to teach the English classes. Um, we, they didn't, many years at this school in Sacatepec, they didn't have an English teacher. You know, nobody wants to go out and live in a rural place. Um, so they asked me one year if I would teach an English class at the high school, well, junior high. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's confusing because they call it a secondaria, which sounds like, anyway, it's a junior high. Um, so we ask our bosses, our supervisors, and generally they want us to concentrate on translation and literacy kinds of things. But, but this was the felt need of people in town. They wanted to know why in the world we're there. What were we doing? We weren't doing anything useful. Might as well teach English, you know. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I did teach um, English at the at that school, and the really cool thing that God did out of that we weren't we weren't looking for anything larger or bigger than that. We just said yes, I'll teach English. Um, but many of my students are now um, town authorities. Town authorities, like the town president, was a man who was in my class as a student. And when in Mexican or Spanish culture, when you um, have somebody as your teacher, the title for that is maestra, the teacher, and um, you're always their maestra. He addresses me today as maestra, which is a title of respect. respect yeah. So it, it's interesting that, you know, we have all those connections now that, that are... Paying off in some ways. And even with the dedication, we went into the town hall and asked permission, and they said, whatever you want to do, do. You know, the, you, you, you know, we have keys to the city, sort of, and, and we're respected. And they respect the elderly people there a lot more than some of us do. And, um, and I, I was surprised because I guess we're in that group now. And every time we go there, they just um, roll out the, what do you call it? <laughs> the, the red carpet for us and, and just make life real easy. And they, they give us opportunity, any opportunities we want to do, you know. Yeah, my <laughs> lack of hair, Feta. <laughs> you were asked one time to translate in a court proceeding. Yeah. Well, um, there was a couple of times. There's some, 
in Santa Maria, California, there's a lot of um, international workers, like Latin workers, from different language groups and working in the fields. And I just worked as a court, court interpreter um, for a couple of guys. And Let me just say how that came about. Um, when they get somebody in court who doesn't speak enough Spanish, doesn't speak any English, speaks their native language, they're required to look for an interpreter. And they call Wycliffe. Um, Wycliffe Bible Translators, they know that we um, work extensively in Mexico among the minority languages, so they call us. And so whoever takes the call says, okay, what language is it? You know, where's the person from? And then they say, okay, Doug is a match. <laughs> so that's how he got called. And I, I did it for two different people at two different times there. And one of them I ran into, the, into well, what they did, he had, it was a drunk driving, like hit and, I didn't hit anyone, but he got another wreck with car, third timer, um, and they put him in jail. I, we did a plea bargain thing, and they put him in jail for six months, I think, and then they deported him. And then I ran into him in the village, and I was afraid that he wouldn't like me, but he was, he was friendly. <laughs> and the other guy, I don't know what happened to him. I'm not sure. So, so thank you. And why don't, um, why don't you pray? Okay. Did you have something you were going to say? They are. In fact, they protect us from outsiders. When we were there in the village, when we lived there, we lived there for how many years? 15 years or something like that. And... Um, and if somebody came that was antagonistic against us, and what are you guys doing here? The, the Mistec people would stand up. He's part of our group. Just leave him alone. And so, you know, they would defend us. And so we felt really, really safe there. And they watched our children. We didn't have to, we didn't half the time, well, we shouldn't say this because they might take them away here. We did half the time, they're kind of old to take away. Um, you know, they were just running around with the other kids, and we had no idea where they were. And we'd ask the neighbor, where's Paul? Oh, he's over there. <laughs> you know, they keep an eye on him. And, 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 um, and as far as I know, nothing bad happened to him. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you probably can't see the whole map of Mexico here, but um, this at the top, of course, is the border with the U.S. And then our, the area that we work in is way down here um, in the, in the, where it curves. Um, and you're right in, in what you've heard that um, Mexico is very dangerous in the northern part uh, close to the border. That's where all the drug cartels are working. And there are, of course, drug cartels working other places as well. But, um, for example, we used to drive back and forth from Mexico to the U.S. when we were up here for a furlough or something medical. Um, Wycliffe no longer allows us to drive in, in that border area. It's, it's not safe. So we always were, allowed, were required to fly back and forth now. Um, but down where we are... People kind of fly under the radar in terms of um, nobody cares too much about these small, in the mountains kind of uh, village areas. Um, it's that's not where the big drug influences are. They're in larger cities, um, and so I'm not saying that there's never any danger um, down where we are, but it's less. It's much less than. In the where the drug wars are being fought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. We we uh, occasionally stumble on something that we shouldn't have seen, and then we quickly act like we didn't see it. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, actually, I, I ran into here. I, I ran the marathon here in in uh, the, what do you call it? The Avenue of the Giants a few years back. And uh, I stayed with uh, the, what, what, the Yates, and I didn't even know where they lived, and my phone doesn't work. It still doesn't work here very well. Um, and so I was trying to find their ranch you know, area down there, and I kind of went someplace else, and I found all these greenhouses with fans and marijuana, and, and they said, beware of dogs. There was no do I thought it was their place, but I thought, no, I don't think this is their place. And some... some um, Spanish-speaking workers, and I just says, I think I got the wrong place. I just left. And <laughs> so anyway, so but I I just believe that I know that God protects us. You know, there's been situations where um, 
we were in danger, probably, and but God was watching over us. Um, it's a problem there. They're, they're mostly um, their producers. It's a, a agriculture area. They produce, I think, marijuana, probably, but not a lot there. But and it's also a thoroughfare where they come down from the coast where they, they people. And so you hear about things. And sometimes people get killed because in the local people. And so it's happening. I just don't ask questions. No. Uh, <laughs> I ran into a lady one time. We were doing s survey. Oh, it's quarter till now. Never mind. We were doing survey. Like um, um, we, I was trying to find out, does this town speak like these people or like these people? And and we ran into a lady that was sweeping um, a, a patio with, with had a crop that was drying on it, and I didn't know what it was. And then um, it was an old lady, about you know fifty or sixty, and uh, and. I mean, she, they get older faster there. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know what it was, and I asked a dumb question, what is this? And then I, I could smell it. I, I smoked a little bit when I was younger. And, uh, and I said, oh, I know what it is. And she says, well, do you want some? I said, no, no, not today. <laughs> anyway. And they grow poppies for, for heroin, too. Some. All right, on that note. <laughs> Um, let's just close out our time here, and um, you'll be hearing more from Doug in, during the next session. So um, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these precious people of Mexico who um, have retained their culture and their language, and now they have um, the New Testament that speaks to them in their heart language. We just thank you for everything that has gone together to make that possible. We thank you for this church and the part that it has had in making that possible. And Father, we, we pray that you would honor your word. Your word says that um, as your word goes forth, um, it will water, it will bring forth a crop. And so we pray for that among the Mestecs of Sakatapec. We ask that you would um, give them a hunger and a thirst for your word and that your word would um, begin to change their hearts and their, their um, fears, their um, just all of the things that you want to do to change their lives. We ask this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.